Welcome to Soul Fire Wisdom with Kate Olson. As an evolving spirit and change adventure navigator, it is Kate's mission to empower and guide you on your path and inspire your truest passions. She will encourage you to share your gifts, speak your truth, and ignite your inner wisdom and purpose. She hopes to do so with a little humor and grace and her own soul fire passion. Kate talks with amazing guests who have embraced the pursuit and are fanning the flames of their own passion, purpose, and soul fire wisdom. Now here's your host, Kate. Welcome to this special broadcast of soul fire wisdom. Um, our broadcast today, our special panel discussion is on uh, bias to bigotry, causes and solutions for moving forward. And unfortunately, we're starting a little late. Uh, this is the first time I had so many people on and technology, um, uh, you know, did its thing. So um, I'm going to say to the speakers, um, mute your mics until I bring the whole group on it on again, um, because there's some squeaky noise. So I want to uh, take just a minute to say, you know, why I decided to do this panel other than, uh, you know, our whole year of uh, many different awarenesses. Um, I guess my thought of having uh, discussions on this started actually in 2019. And um, in 2019, when we were having all of those different uh, shootings and uh, uh a lot of things happening around the country that were kind of unsettling i did uh something called the soul talk which is a video blog that i do called um calm finding calm in the chaos and during this soul talk uh kind of unintentionally the topic of uh race came up and i was having the discussion with um a fellow coach, uh, Hallie Bourne, and, uh, you know, we had a pretty in-depth uh, discussion on race, but then afterwards, uh, I thought, you know, we're two older uh, white ladies, and uh, maybe we weren't really able to address the topic, you know, as well as it should have been. And so I asked um, Deree, who is on the panel here, um, on the panel here to do another soul talk with me. And that one uh, was called Race in America. And the reason why I asked Deree to do that talk was because he's you know, he's a millennial who grew up in Chicago and um, he had, he was a friend of my son and he had mentioned um, the fear that he had about driving. Every time he got in the car, he mentioned that, you know, he was pretty much terrified. And, uh, now afterwards if you listen to the talk uh we had it was kind of pretty much uh foretelling the situation with george floyd and then um well everybody probably knows all the things that happened around race and uh bringing well, bringing to light circumstances really around race. And uh, when I look back even on the talk that I had with Ree, I noticed that, well, I, I was born in North Dakota. My parents were for, from North Dakota. 
uh, but I grew up in the Seattle suburbs and I um, saw my parents who were, you know, they did have a lot of racist ideas and were bigoted, but um, their feelings were based on ignorance and lack of exposure. So over my lifetime, I saw them change. So I think I had it in my head that that's how it always worked, that if you were tolerant and people were exposed to different races, then they would change. In the discussion with Doree, I realized that I was kind of um, maybe telling him that you know, he needed to be more tolerant. And then everything happened in 2020. And I thought, you know, wait a minute. Um, maybe we've been too tolerant. Because I realized that it isn't just ignorance and lack of exposure. There's more to the issues with racism. And so, you know, that's what led me to want to have this panel. And I want to say a couple more things and then I'll introduce them. One is that we have a diverse panel, but you know, it doesn't represent the, the diversity of the country. Um, it's just all that we could really fit in in two hours and the number of spots that we can have on the panel. And the members in the panel, although they may be able to bring to light some uh, views of different groups, they are representing themselves and not all the people in those racial or ethnic groups. So um, I, let's get started with our discussion and um, I'm going to bring the rest of the group on now. Uh oh. Uh, we seem to have lost a couple people here. What happened? Okay. Are you here, Dere? Are you here, Dere? I'm, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, we, who did we lose? Hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. We lost somebody. Bettina, um, we lost Bettina. Hello, Michael. I'm back. Okay, where did Bettina go? Are you guys here? There she is. <laughs> so I, I think, um, is this Angela that's on Facebook that commented that that she didn't get the link? I, I believe so. Looks like it. it. Is, if it is Angela, I resent you the link in Messenger, so you can try that. It just says Facebook user. Okay, so the first question I'm going to ask the group is to go around um, and introduce yourself and tell us why you decided to um, to speak on the panel today. So we'll just start with um, Davina and go right through the panel. 
Okay, great. Uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me to this conversation. Uh, I am Davina Lyons. I am the um, founder of um, Authentic, Authentic Me, which is a community for women, and also Authentic Best Life, which is a community for young adults and teens. And it's about self-awareness and resilience. And so I do workshops monthly. In addition to that, I am also uh, a, an eighth grade English arts, English language arts teacher. Uh, so um, very much so think this is a, an, an extremely important conversation. Happy to be a part of it and um, looking forward to engaging. Jim? I'm Jim Kellner. I'm a hypnotist, motivational speaker. Uh, you know, I wanted to participate in this because, uh, you know, boy, things are just so uh, kind of crazy. And they've just gotten, it seemed like they've just gotten worse over this last year. And of course, then we see the, you know, I think the uh, so many incidents last year, like the George George Floyd being, I mean, literally murdered right there uh, on video in front of us. Um, you know, something, something's got to be done, something. And so the more we talk about it, I, I'm just hoping that we can uh, work through these kind of things. Thanks, Kate. And May. Good morning, everyone. I'm N. May Mangles. I am an intuitive strategic advisor to really high, high performing individuals uh, across the world. I am also a co-facilitator in an organization called Safe Place to Peace Bridges, in which we talk about the upsetting conditions of racism across our world. And I am honored to be here. I feel that this is my civic duty. Thank you. Alex. Good morning. And thank you so much for the invitation to be here. I'm, I'm uh, extremely honored and blessed to be here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, because I think um, I think there's a couple of different things that I can contribute. Uh, first of all, I'm a writer and a speaker based in San Diego. Uh, so coming out of Southern California, which is extremely diverse, but also uh, being a border town, um, you know, we have quite a bit of uh, diversity challenges and, and just outright racism uh, when it comes to our border communities. Uh, I actually was born in South America. Uh, in Colombia, so I have that perspective. Yet I am a Latino who is extremely light skinned. And oftentimes I can evade the perils of racism just because of the fact that of my skin tone. Uh, so that gives a unique dynamic, I feel. Uh, and then on top of that, I have a physical disability, which I know isn't necessarily, you know, germane to, to today's topic, but it kind of adds a different layer of perspective. Uh, well, all of those things, uh, I hope to be able to contribute to the conversation. So, so we changed our configuration here. Uh, Melissa? Hi there. I am Dr. Melissa Bird, and I am a coach and a public speaker. And uh, I teach people how to harness their inner rebel to make a difference in their lives and their communities. I am Southern Paiute from Utah. And my ancestors come from the area near Las Vegas, St. George, and the North Rim of the Grand Canyon. I do workshops and facilitation in Christian communities to help people think about truth and reconciliation in uh, the context of Jesus, racism, and social justice. And I sit on the Truth and Reconciliation Committee and the Committee to End Racism for the Episcopal Diocese of Oregon. So I am very happy to be here. Thank you. Dorie. Dorie. Okay, we'll come back to Dorie. Uh, hi, can you, can you all hear me? Yes. Go go ahead and introduce yourself. Three. Yeah. 
Can I be heard? You hear me? Uh, you you are here. Can you hear me? Heard. Yes. Keep talking. Keep okay. Okay. We'll, okay. We'll, we'll, I'm Dorie Arrington. Um, thank you, Kate, for having me on uh, this show here. I I think this is incredibly okay. important. Okay, could could we try this? Could everybody um, mute their mic except the person speaking? Uh oh, not not you, Dory. <laughs> I think we lost him. Oh, there he comes. Is there a way for him to dial in on a telephone as well no, for audio? No. no. Oh. oh, I I don't know how that would work. Um, Bettina? Is he there? Yeah. Sure uh, thing. No, let's go ahead, Bettina, and introduce yourself. He, he's He's not there. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm Bettina Carey, and I'm a Latina, and I'm born to Puerto Rican parents. And my father, very dark, my very my mother, very light skinned. And so I um, really grew up experiencing racism on some level. And so I'm really happy to be here to talk a little bit about my story and how, you know, it might impact my future and everybody's future and what I can contribute. And I'm all about empowering women, men, boys and girls. And I help folks to shatter their glass ceilings, to kick their self-imposed limitations to the curb and to live their legacies now. And I'm just uh, excited about speaking today about this very important topic. And uh, I'm gonna pass it back to you, Kate, thank you. Michael. Hello, everyone. Michael Loden here from Final Step International, and I too am a coach and a former probation officer in the LA County area, and for 20 years, and I'm in, this, in the South LA, and I've seen the pipeline, and I've dealt with black black males for the most part, and wrote a book on that. And my country, what I why I'm here is to hear everybody's perspective. Something I may be missing, and, and to, learn, to learn something from someone else who has who has a different one. To look in this the side of the mirror see what I may be missing to, to give my perspective as a light skull, light skinned black American male. Okay, Angela. Hi, greetings everyone. I am Angela Marshall. Thank you so much, Kate, for the invitation to be able to come on and just be a part of the solution that is so refreshing. So many times we hear people that are just complaining and jawing about racism or about stereotype stigmas, but very few are doing something about it. So thank you for that. Again, I'm Angela Marshall. I am a creative content consultant. I'm also a best-selling author of The Story in Life of an Ex-NFL Wife, and I'm a featured author in Women Who Lead Extraordinary Lives All Across the Globe. I am on this call, I'm on this panel, I'm on this forum simply because I want to learn, I want to listen, and then I also want to share just the knowledge of me being multiracial. I'm sure first sight people don't really know what my background is, what my ethnicity is. I've had that my entire life, which is really made for some, some really good conversations. And then it's also been some growth within myself too, to be a little bit more, I guess, empathetic towards others that may or may not know how to identify within themselves. So my goal is just to live, to teach others how to live vicariously through themselves and also just to help the world to be a better place. Thank you. Okay, do we want to try again, Dari? Dari? Mm-mm. Dari, are you here? 
He's frozen, Kate. Okay. Says someone is trying to enter the studio. It's both. Can you? Hello? Dree? Okay, Dree, if you can hear um, devices. Okay, he's gone. All right, um, so I'm gonna go to question two and if he gets back, we'll, um, we'll add him again. So how how did you see the racial implications um, of the capital insurrection? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I guess a show of hands on who wants to comment on that. Alex. <laughs> Sure. Well, I think um, as far as the capital insurrection goes, there is no doubt, and it was quite obvious, first of all, that the images that we saw were 98% uh, white people. And it was very obvious that they were very angry, disenfranchised white people. Uh, certainly not a lot of uh, diversity uh, going on there. Uh, although reportedly one of the members, uh, one of the leaders, of the Proud Boys uh, white supremacist group uh, has some uh, Hispanic uh, background. Uh, so that's a whole different discussion, I think. But I think what really stood out was if you compare the amount of um, security and law enforcement that were present on the Capitol steps, uh, comparable to the Black Lives Matter protests over the summer, it was night and day. And uh, just in terms of the numbers, and in terms of how they treated the protesters, uh, many of the uh, security taking selfies with the protesters, uh, even opening gates so that they could enter, uh, and, and, and in many cases, really using um, force as a last resort. Whereas during the Black Lives Matter protest, uh, there were more of them. There were, they were uh, far more confrontational and ominous and um, in my mind, there is no question that had those protesters been darker skinned, they would have been treated a lot differently. Anyone else? Yeah, I'll say something. And also, you know, to piggyback Alex is the fact that this is where that entitlement comes in. Because you, because you look like me, yeah, I'm going to treat you a little differently than if you were a different color than me. Because remember the, the the subconscious images we have about certain people of a certain color, they have they tend to be more violent. Uh, they tend to be more uh, what is this? What's what I'm looking for? Well, we'll stay with violent and and causing more trouble. But this one, in, in this case, it's like we will allow you to get away with it and and set your point. And if it gets too you know uh, if it gets too violent in the protest. Then we'll do something about it, which came later on down the line. But you know, back to the back to the, the point is because you look like me, I will treat you differently. I'll say that's it. You know, I, I find it interesting that this is not a new narrative. This is not nothing about any of which we've been experiencing is new to any of us, uh, in one form or another, right? Um, and and in yet we keep hearing these things. We know what we saw at the Capitol. We know um, how they were treated 
differently. We see all of those things. The, the, the why is probably the, the toughest part, but it isn't in a way. It's about identity. It's about a deep identity that people carry. And, you know, in the beginning, uh, Kate, you said that you felt your parents, um, you know, it was, it was ignorance and ignorance of exposure. Uh, to a great deal, that is it. But more than anything, I think that, that it's about fear. Those people at the Capitol fear that they're going to lose freedoms that they've enjoyed as a race, as a people. Um, I think the, the, the issue here is that there's so much fear that no one wants to take the time to really understand and get to know that which they fear right? False evidence appearing real. We've heard that a lot. And that's what's happening is that people have been raised with a level of fear that someone is going to compromise their life, their lifestyle, their whatever. I have, I have white friends that I've talked to who have said to me, um, and, and that, you know, up until all of this stuff happened, I had no idea how they felt. And what I heard was, I'm not going to, this isn't about race. This isn't about you. This is about, I am, I want to protect my freedom in this country. The thing is we as a people, people of color have never had that opportunity to see it that way. We've, we've had to protect in a different way. And so what you're calling your freedom is actually my oppression. If you're not careful. So I think that's the discussion. Um, I I don't, uh, I, I think we see all the surface behaviors. We understand the surface behaviors, but the truth of the matter is it's about fear. And how do I make you feel better? How do I make you feel better without me feeling worse? That's what to me the discussion is. It's a critical piece. To, it's a critical piece to what I, uh, I've been talking about when it comes to uh, the work we've been doing here in Oregon around really acknowledging what has happened here historically, Oregon was founded as a whites only state. There, the, the complete and total annihilation of indigenous people here, people don't talk about it because Oregon is considered to be this sort of liberal progressive place. And it's, it is hideously racist. And I, one of the things that I, I've been bringing up in conversation with people is you're a fear, you're afraid of losing friends, family, or standing, privilege, right? Like that fear is so critical. And we very rarely talk about it in the context of white supremacist work or anti-racism work. That fear is the foundation that white people really struggle with coming to terms with. And it is the most important piece to starting to explore how we dismantle white supremacy and racism. Fear of losing status, fear of losing friends, and fear of losing family is the, the starting point to shifting. You know, what jumped out at me um, based on what I observed, you know, in, during the insurrection and then, you know, many years preceding that, a friend of mine who grew up in Europe and in Germany specifically, you know, had a lot of fears going on. And, um, you know, I'm like always trying to find the way to be able to, to have conversations. Right. And her worry and, you know, was legitimate, even made more legitimate on the day of the insurgents. And what I noticed was that the, the ability for a group to become very much more violent just by the very sake that they were in a group. So this group think that occurs is very much something for us to um, uh, better understand and to uh, to you know relate to it in a, in a manner because when a group gets together and they do things, I mean, I'm sure there were people there who didn't intend to do things and then they did things, right? Just because of the fact that they were part of this group think mentality. So I think that's something really important to note. Yes. Another thing is, is what I brought up in the beginning is my parents were, you know, 
ignorant and unexposed to people of other races. But there is another, uh, they, they weren't bombarded with, you know, hateful and, uh, you know, bigoted ideas all of their life. There are people who that is what, what they get. And that's a different kind of uh, racism. It's a different kind of prejudice than hatred. And it doesn't go away as easily as being just exposed to other people and other uh, cultures. And so it needs to be addressed differently, I think. You know, I, I sit on the University of Washington Alumni Association and we're going through some significant um, training and development around the topic of race. And one of the slides that was presented by the Intercultural uh, Development Continuum was a slide that shows denial to polarization, which is a lot about defense and reversal, minimization, acceptance, and then adaptation. And each of us starts somewhere in this continuum and moving towards adaptation, moving towards acceptance is the goal. And that's a very important a continuum that they've established and are studying and are taking our board through a process so that we can move from wherever it is we are in the continuum to the further place of adaptation. And I'll use my personal story. So I grew up in a home where my father was very, very dark skinned, my mother very light. And on, on one particular occasion, we were traveling to the South and we were stopping for the night. And my dad went in to book a room for a, a motel and he was denied. So we sent my sister in who was very fair skinned to book the room and she was accepted. And so I've grown up experiencing racism, even not just in the United States, but even when I was living in Puerto Rico, there is a lot of racism between the dark skinned uh, Puerto Ricans and the light skinned Puerto Ricans. So racism can actually really exist within an, even its own culture, right? So it's literally taking a look at ourselves. Where do we stand on the continuum? Are we in denial? Are we polarizing? Are we minimizing? As a nation, I'd say we definitely are minimizing. Can we move towards acceptance? And finally, can we move towards adaptation where we actually are anti-racist, moving towards action? This is really the critical phase that um, I would love to see more Americans move towards uh, over time. Yes. Yeah. So and, and does anyone else have any comments on the, what happened at the Capitol? If not, I'm going to move to the next question. Okay. So if you saw the interview with Oprah about, um, or with, uh, Harry and Megan, uh, what are your thoughts with regards to similar attitudes within the U S well, I would just like to say, um, coming from a woman who has been on both sides of the coin, as far as being able to tell my story and then being told, how dare you say that you have had prejudices or you've had, you know, racism spewed at you because you're light, you have privilege you're entitled because you're light skin. Um, I thought that Megan and Harry, the interview as a whole, being able to come out and share their journey, I thought that it was therapeutic and it was freeing for them because as a storyteller myself and as a writer, as you know, a woman who is just on a global mission to help others to live vicariously through themselves, that's what I exhort people to do. Tell your story and don't back down from it and others have to respect it, whether you like it or not. Now, one thing that I have heard that I think now people are saying 
that she can't experience the racism because you can't really tell what she is by looking at her with her color, which is absolutely ab absurd and ridiculous. But this is something that I have endured my entire life, being brought up in an all African-American family, which the exposure, don't get me wrong, I'm not pro-black, anti-black, con black, Latino, whatever, because I'm a mixture of four different ethnicities and I value each one of them. And that's another reason why, and I know we're gonna talk about the Black Lives Matter, that's another reason why I don't get into the whole Black Lives Matter. I am human life matters. And that's the way that I see it and that's the way that I feel. But as far as Harry and Megan being able to share their story and come out, I think people tell their story and they talk about their messages and their trials and their struggles simply so that they can be free. Because I know for me, that's what it was. It wasn't to make my cousins who were dark skinned and told me that my hair at the time, I had really, really long hair. I keep it cut for a reason. Um, you know, told me that I always thought I was better than or I was, you know, I, I wasn't better than because I was uh, light skinned or I looked different from them, my eye color and, and all this other kind of stuff. Um, I think that being able to share your journey and talk about it in a way that helps you to become free from any type of stereotype, stigma, pain, pressures or whatever, I think that that's what you should do. So kudos to Harry and Megan, whether or not they should have done it on Oprah. Mm, you know, again, I think that's a person's, that's their personal preference. But what I do strongly believe in, and this would be my last point, um, when I tell my story or I tell my side, you don't get to discount it. So no one gets to discount how Megan feel, feel, feels, how Harry feels or, or felt, because that's their story and that's their journey. And that's what I believe in. Any other comments? Alex? Hi, can, I just wanna check and make sure everyone can hear me actually this time. Yes. Thank you, awesome. Okay, um, I'm Coach Dury Arrington. Um, thank you, Kate, for having me on the show. I've been looking forward to this. Um, so happy that I got to fix the technical issues. Um, what with Angela just said, I think it's in simple terms, just that. It's their truth. Um, it doesn't really matter about what all everybody else's opinion about how these two individuals felt um in their life no one can dictate no one can say anything other than accepting that um and i just i i thought that um uh, with with that interview is that they um are just speaking the truth and that's that's really all that matters it's about being free to, enough to say how you feel what you're experiencing and going from there and, and just looking forward so i just wanted to tap in with with Anna, Angela um, in agreeance with that, because that's, I don't think you can explain it more. Um, you can try to, but it's, it's in simple, it's just the truth and that's their truth. And so I just wanted to say that. Okay, anybody else? Alex? Yes, um, I, I found it extremely interesting that even the people that are the most privileged literally in the world, royals, have so many of the same societal issues that we do in greater society. I mean, there was fear, and, and fear was mentioned earlier on the panel, right? There was fear about the possibility of the child, the baby being quote unquote too dark. Um, there was general fear about essentially Megan's culture uh, being a stain on, on the royal family itself. Um, it, it, it was fascinating to me and, and very similar to what Angela said. You know, you can't tell someone that their experience is valid or invalid. Their experience is their experience and how they feel about it is their truth and completely legitimate to them. And so it's been really quite amazing and preposterous to me over the last week to see people uh, on social media primarily uh, really kind of bash uh, everything that, that Harry and Meghan said uh, because, well, you know, they're supposedly they're royal, so they have no problems. 
that's been kind of people's resentment towards it. And I really feel that it also goes beyond just fodder and pop culture fodder in the aspect that Megan revealed that she had, quote, uh, methodical thoughts about suicide and how she wanted to just end it all. And when we allow racism and our views towards race and our experiences based on race to impact our mental health, that's when I, 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 I would hope people would get serious about it, that it isn't just feelings or emotions or perspective or this is just what you've gone through, what, what, what I've gone through. You're young, you'll snap out of it. It's a tough world. You know, all those sorts of mindsets. When you are dealing with mental health, which we don't talk about nearly enough in this country anyway, and you have someone essentially on global television making a plea for help saying all of these incidents of racism have impacted my mental health it it bespeaks to me what i feel um so many have been trying to say i mean really forever but it seems to be more amplified within the last five years is this is more than just my heart this is more than just my feelings personally i feel like that should be enough but for for those whom that isn't enough I would hope that when someone begins to say, this is impacting my mental health and I'm contemplating ending my life here, that that should be not only a red flag, but a red siren that we all should stop the way we do when we hear an ambulance, we should stop everything we're doing and reach out to that person. Definitely. So, I wanted to just okay. contribute to that point in regards to what Alex was saying. I believe that um, also Oprah's opportunity to take a national stage was more like a PSA, a public service announcement, to be aware. What people like Oprah can do with her stage presence is to create greater awareness. And my friends who are assorted colors, assorted cultures, I'm half Japanese, half Chinese. I just found out through an ancestry swab that I'm 11% Korean. Go figure. Um, and I'm married to a German Irish white boy. And um, that's why we have basset hounds. Anyways, the, the, the ignorance and bigotry of the past are, have a time now to be shaken. Mm -hmm. Not stirred, but shaken. And what we want to do is take opportunity in conversations like this to be aware and open our heart space that the former, former beliefs, our former limiting beliefs, are that from a, a kind of, um, oh, it just makes me so mad when I talk about this. It, it's, it's from a British cultural norm in, in their case where we have a white cultural norm, we have an Asian cultural norm. Let's break that down into the Chinese and the Japanese and the Korean. We all have our space. And now we're shaking that space. Yes. And, and I like that one thing on that one is this, when, when Angela and Coach Doris spoke about, she told her truth, that truth rattled the tree. And when you shake the tree, some things are gonna fall out that you don't wanna see. And this is what we're dealing with. And, and it's kind of like in America, you know, the uh, the, the, the killing of, uh, what I see, I forget his name. I just, I can't. George Floyd. Um, yeah, George Floyd. He, he, we saw what actually happens in America. That shook our tree in America for us to actually do something now. And we gotta keep going. You know, it was just waking us up. And that's what Megan did. She, she woke up the, uh, the palace. Are we? I mean, let's be real. Where did, where did slavery really start? You know, England, Dutch, pork, Portuguese. It's just, you know, so she she took a $1,200, a 200 year old, you know, system and said, hey, you know, and that, and now we see, do they really think like that? Maybe they can move forward and improve and do something different. And, and if I may, let me add one point to that. It is fascinating to me that in the following week, um, the popularity ratings of Harry and Meghan have reportedly gone down. So essentially, they've, they've, they've plummeted with the Brits just for speaking their truth, for simply saying 
this is what happened to us this is what we've been experiencing you know we lost we, we've lost our security over this we had to move because of this for speaking those truths and revealing all of that the people in england are would rather preserve their image of how they want the royal family to be and how they want their culture to be rather than saying let's shake that tree and do something about this um it it, it, it is fascinating to me i i would certainly wish that there would be some sort of um result of where there was minneapolis uh with with you're right michael i mean it's the, the tree that took the whole country and really forced a lot of change and i mean just a sea tide of change coast to coast um, but it's really interesting how it's been the reverse effect uh, in England. Across the pond, people are upset that all of a sudden the family secrets are out. When really, this is an opportunity for them. This is an opportunity for liberation to say, hey, this has gone on. And I'm sure, I'm sure, which in England, particularly in London, one of the most diverse cities in the world where you have quite a few uh, black British. I'm positive that that interview made millions of folks over there feel liberated because they were probably saying, yes, this has happened to me as well. But instead of waking them up, it's had the reverse effect. That country is now kind of circling the wagons and saying, well, it's a shame that this was even brought up. It's a shame that this was, was ever made public. I I'm glad they did it. And I hope there is real change affected by it well it, alex um it it has had that effect over there there's a lot of the the black population over there speaking up about how how they felt about it and their uh black population over there is fairly significant so part of the country is um not on this on the side of uh you know sweeping it under the rug so well, i think we also have to remember guys that according to societal culture truth hurts that's what we've been brainwashed and programmed into thinking but it doesn't truth heals and when you walk in that and you actually start letting things out not just from racism but stereotype stigma family secrets, how you feel. When you start revealing your truth, you start healing. There's a, my mentor, she says, you can't heal unless you reveal. So obviously if, you know, people are programmed into thinking, even from little, oh, if I tell the truth, I'm gonna get a spanking or I'm gonna be disciplined or this is gonna happen, or, you know, there's gonna be repercussions and consequences. Who wants to, who would dare want to tell their truth? But, you know, so, Angela. Your, your point, Alex. I, I agree with what you're saying, Angela. I also think that um, this has a lot to do with identity in general, our deep identity, right? So, you know, when you challenge someone's identity, you're challenging the very core of who they are. And obviously, as individuals, we want to protect our identity. But when you think about uh, group think or crowd think or country think, you know, this is a situation where they are exposed and they already felt that they were elite, that they were, you know, I joke all the time. I was born in New Haven, Connecticut. I remember in school being very excited about the fact, I never told people I was born in Connecticut. I said I was born in New England because I had teachers that emphasized New England. And so I thought that was pretty special as a, as a small child. Well, that, because of that, it was very important that I spoke well. It was very important that I did a lot of things because I was born in New England. That was my deep identity. And it has carried with me my love of education. You know, so if I break that thing down, I understand that about myself. See, self-awareness is important, right? What's happening is that people want to protect their identity. People want to protect what they believe is right. And they are not empathetic to others. And the lack of empathy is what Harry and Meghan are experiencing, a total lack of empathy. It doesn't matter how they felt. 
It's about how I feel. It's about how our queen is seen or our country is seen. And, and, and that's all that matters. And so uh, unless people are willing to be self-accountable, self-aware, then accountable for their feelings and willing to heal, right, Angela? Because as you said, it's about healing. Well, you have to be willing to heal. They don't feel that they have anything that needs to be healed, you know? And so that's the problem. It's about it's just, you know, personal accountability. We don't have enough of that. We don't have enough of that because if each individual were to truly be honest and what they fear, they learn about and take themselves to another level, the whole world would be a better place. But unfortunately, I have to make you shrink in order for me to feel better. That's the attitude. And it's really, really sad. Definitely. So, I have a question it, for you all. Um, be we have for the two hours we have about 10 minutes left and we have about uh five questions that we were going to cover left so if we go beyond the two hours who can stay and who would have to leave i can stay that's what i'm saying yeah i can stay also i have to leave Okay. I can stay. I can um, stay about thirty more minutes. You can stay what? Thirty more minutes. Okay. Um. So, uh, what I'll say is, we'll try to go through. We'll stay maybe an extra half hour, and we'll try to go through most of the questions. And anyone who has to leave, um, try to let me know in advance so that you can say goodbye and give your contact info. So um, the next question is, uh, what impacts has, um, has the increased emphasis on racial inequities over the past several years that we've been experiencing? And specifically in two, uh, 2020, had on you personally. So who would like to comment on that? I'll answer that. Okay, go ahead, Jim. You know, I just wanna, um, I wanna say, you know, uh, thank you all for being here. I'm, I'm really enjoying hearing your conversation. Um, at the risk of sounding like a big baby, I'll tell you what, what it's been like for the last few years. Um, uh, for a, uh, a straight white male, uh, sometimes I feel like I'm walking on eggshells. And I'm not looking for sympathy or anything, but I'm just letting you know that when, um, you know, for instance, if I put something on, you know, I, I share a post or something, um, I have to give it a lot of thought, you know, am I, and plus I'm a, I'm a, I'm a former comedian too. So uh, my filter doesn't work all that good sometimes. So, um, you know, if, when I'm, when I post something, uh, I'm, I'm often, well, I won't say often, but I'm, Frequently, I'm surprised at what people uh, read into it, and uh, I, you know, I understand that they're coming. You know, they're coming from with different lenses, and as much as we try to walk in somebody else's shoes, we simply can't. I can, I can try to imagine what it's like to to be a to be a black male driving and getting pulled over, but truly, I, I can't. I can't empathize completely um, for those kind of things. But um, so it it has been, and and one of the challenges too is that um, as an ally on all fronts. Uh, it, it does feel like sometimes um, people, and not, not everyone, but, but a lot of people kind of, to, kind of push us away and by, by some of the things they say, you know, by generalizations, just like, you know, just like white people may say all black people, you know, people will say, you know, white males are the you know, problem or whatever. And I'm like, I didn't do anything. As far as I know, you know, I'm, I'm just saying subconsciously, who knows? But so I just, you know, that's, that's all I wanted to say. Um, some of us are really trying to do better. And if, if we offend you in some way, honestly, a lot of us are not trying to, I swear, I swear. We're just trying to learn. Jim, I have this conversation constantly with my business partner and um, she and I are totally opposite. Ebony and Ivory, I call us. And I love, I love, love, love the fact that she, and she's listening now, <laughs> so I won't say her name, but I will say this. I love the fact that she allows herself to be vulnerable and ask me questions and discuss things as they come up. 
And has she always gotten it right? No. And it's funny. She may say something like you said, and I would say to her, Ooh, don't ever say that again, or don't post that. And she'll go, why? And I mean, you know, I don't, I don't get it. And I will explain it. And she'd go, ah, makes sense. You're absolutely right. You're not going to get, you're not going to understand how someone else feels about something that you do not have the uh, capacity to feel because you aren't that person. Um, I think the the true ally is the person who says, who's honest, like you just did, and says, this is what I'm experiencing. This is how I feel. And, and, and you, again, if I'm empathetic, I just mentioned we need to be more empathetic, then I obviously have to be able to understand where you're coming from. And I totally can understand it. Uh, it's about keeping the dialogue going. It's about being open, not getting all butt hurt. And I think a lot of people get offended and walls go up and that's it. And that's on both sides. I'm not just saying that, you know, that's on, on both sides. So we have to be better again about being empathetic, but also about having tough conversations and understanding the motive behind the conversations and not bring offense into play. But let me just say this really quick. This has to do with geographics too. We have to be careful. Uh, as Kate mentioned, all of us on this call are not living the life that some people are in this country. Okay. So I totally get, I'm, you know, I'm not the same as perhaps uh, a black woman who's working, uh, a, a, you know, a, a labor job in Mississippi or wherever. I mean, I'm just pulling something out of the air. There's a difference. So I cannot assume, you know, I hold my own. I don't have any issues with certain things that I know others do. That doesn't mean that I'm not in the struggle or that I'm not supportive, but I actually am, you know, I just don't experience those things because I don't allow it. I believe we teach people how to treat us, but I'm afforded the ability, even with my dark skin, I'm afforded the ability to, to, to handle my business in that way, because that's the way I identify, but not everyone is there. So education, keep communicating, you know, stand up for what you believe in, Regardless, that's what I say. So anyone, anyone else have a comment on that? I just like to say, oh, I'm sorry. I, I just want to say real quick, you know, when you mentioned the South, I'll tell you, I have a preconceived notion that, you know, uh, even though I know this isn't true, if I hear that some a white person is from the South, I automatically assume they're going to be racist. I, I mean, I have to I have to dismiss it quickly. But but like but like um, I who was I can't remember who was talking about it now. But but you know, actually, Oregon is extremely racist. Uh, a lot. I mean, there's a lot of racists in Oregon, Idaho, places in the North, and so um, so I know it's 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 not it's not really it's not accurate. But I I have that prejudice, you know, against white people. Um, Jim, uh, you speaking on Oregon, I'm here in Seattle. Um, I, I see it every day from all shapes and forms. Um, and I'm, I'm a young black coach in a predominantly white neighborhood and I'm coaching mostly white children. Um, uh, one, I think is very important for me to be in that neighborhood dressed like I'm dressed. Um, and constantly creating my own narrative to my living to me being um because i get all kinds of different looks and all different uh body languages and reactions um because i don't I, I'm, I'm just in an island by myself and so um i experience these things from just the subtleness of different conversations the topics um just the way that certain individuals decide to approach me um, I understand like COVID um, and, you know, being that social distance is, but see, I've experienced that before COVID. And so that being distant and, you know, not too sure what's going on and uh, whatnot. And I, I, I try to, you know, I take it with a grain of salt. I just, I take it as it is and I move on because one thing I do know is that these children are more impacted by what I'm saying to them in my body language um more than what you know their their parents are and so they're they're gonna go home at the end of the day and either learn something because of what coach Dury 
has told them, and I, I like to be super transparent with my children. I, I watch a lot of coaches that deal with a lot of children, and I'm always going against the grain. I mean, I've I've built my success in life by going against the grain and walking on eggshells and testing different things. And thankfully, I'm still here. But um, I'm never afraid to take risks, and I'm never afraid to communicate with all kinds of different people and just hear their stories. Um, and like. Uh, Davina was saying is, you know, empathy. I walk with empathy all the time. Um, I'm not just some 30 millennial uh, black man, just like super angry and just all this, like I feel all these different emotions, but I think at the end of the day, it's about being civil and uh, being able to communicate and talk your truth, uh, whether someone is going to be able to relate. I think a lot of times also that we, we get to a point where everybody wants to relate to everybody and you simply cannot you cannot just relate and i think uh with me being in the neighborhood that i i do all of my work um it's 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 really uh important and so you know just going to what you were saying jim you know the walking on eggshells i honestly think that uh we all need to be um in that in that vulnerable place where we just kind of feel like I don't know what's going on because it's it's closer to a restart. If we're all at this bottom uh, floor or we, we just don't know what to do, uh, it opens the, the door for conversations on like, hey, well, what do you think we should do here? Or what do you think we can do here? Um, so I, I would encourage you to continue to, um, to look to walk on more eggshells and look at it from a different perspective and not be afraid of that. And so that's just my two cents. So thank you guys. Yes, and Melissa, I would, Melissa. I would I definitely echo what uh, Darcy Dar Dar said. And, you know, the fact that you're uncomfortable, it kind of gives me goosebumps because I know if you're uncomfortable, you're on your way. And so, I encourage anyone who's listening, you know, just to recognize, um, like Davina said, your own self-awareness. Because I grew up with a dark-skinned parent and a light-skinned parent, I've always known, and a culture that has also racism built into the Puerto Rican culture, I also had to own racism within my own race, right? And this is very little talked about, but it actually exists. And for a long time as I was growing up, I tried to um, not acknowledge the dark side of my skin, but the light side of my skin. It wasn't until I, you know, was my father was in the military and I traveled through all through the military, both in Europe and, and the United States. And I found so much diversity within um, the military families that were present that color just disappeared for me. And, um, but awareness comes first. Awareness, mm -hmm. education, I think is second. And once you've educated yourself adequately, then comes, what do you do to take action? Because this is, I think you asked the question, Kate, you know, what's changed for me is the actions that I'm taking, you know, specifically working with, um, you know, as a board trustee um, at large, trustee for the uh, University of Washington Alumni Association, I would say that we are educating our board so that when we are recruiting our other board members, when we are benefiting our members, that we're deeply aware of the actions that we take. Because truly, you know, be, being that this is a higher education situation, the reality is, is that alone, in a sense, is a divider correct? I mean, you've got people who clearly never get to have higher education. And if you look at the numbers, it's minorities that lack thereof. And so at the end of the day, we have to do more when we know more. I would really love to add something to this. Because stop, stop. I think that stop. one of the most... Nobody talk right now, please. Okay. Um, some of you are better at jumping in than others. So don't talk unless you raise your hand and I call on you. So Melissa, go ahead. I just wanted to say that because there's been two people that have been trying to talk and everybody has jumped in in front of them, even though I called their name. So go ahead, Melissa. Okay, so I think 
part of one of the most important aspects of having these conversations is not writing off people's discomfort with them. And the, these issues are not black and white issues, to use the pun, right? We are not all or nothing. We are, this is messy, messy work. And we have to get really comfortable with being in the mess. And when resistance and rigidity starts to rise, recognizing that and, and owning that that is where the shift happens. The shift doesn't happen in this all or nothing, zero sum game. The shifting comes from being really uncomfortable with what we're hearing and recognizing individual truths of every single person. Not all of us are going to do this work the same. And I think that's the danger uh, of having conversations about dismantling white supremacy and racism is that there are people who think it should be happening in a certain way. And the minute that word should comes into play, we stop listening. We stop having empathy. We stop being vulnerable. We put up a wall. And so I think it's really important for us to think about how are we disrupting and dissolving the rigidity with which we approach these conversations? And how are we opening ourselves up to learning about difference and learning about, about the identities within identities? It's not just about reading a book and being like, okay, I'm not going to be racist anymore. Or, okay, I understand colonization and decolonization and like these are really complicated difficult conversations and topics that we're bringing up and and so i think that if we listen to each other and and really allow grace for that messy ugly middle then i think that's where the long term shifts come about because this is a lifelong process this is not this is not a, I'm going to take a workshop and be more improved. This is a, a constant unraveling of our ancestries and really thinking about how have our grandmothers, 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 and our grandfathers, 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 who are they? Where do they come from? And how do their stories thread into our lives in 2021? And may Oh, Dr. Melissa, thank you so much. Um, I've coined this as hereditary hostage. Uh, this is a word that I, that's come to me I mean, through spirit, actually, that says what we are doing is dismantling hereditary hostage. It's what we know, what we sing, what we believe, what we grew up with. And if we had a chance to grow up with wonderful people, with, with, with guidance, with openness, with empathy, then we have a chance. And I think our action steps are very important is to, even as we are dancing in the face of microaggressions, it's time to apply micro advocacy. And that's what I teach in my courses is that we have a chance to give opportunity to hear another person's story or their belief. Uh, I, I was accosted in a Costco um, early on during the early toilet paper fear. Um, and I had just put one in my cart and a man, a, a white man came up to me and said, what the F are you doing here? Go back to your effing country. And I said, wow, can I ask you what country you're from? <laughs> and I said, you know, I was born in Sherman Oaks, California, right on that Ventura Boulevard. Do you know it? Um, I'm just one of those California girls. And he goes, fuck you. And I said, well, sir, we need to have a conversation. I think you're just scared out of your mind that I just got the last toilet paper, but I'm even more scared of what you are going to dismantle. We had a conversation. Actually, he ended up apologizing to me. I had quite a crowd around me in Costco and, and this husband and wife came up to me and a gentleman, a white gentleman said, I was about to punch him in the throat. I said, no, thank you. I really need to have this conversation. 
I really need to have this conversation, an opportunity to ask him to apply empathy. I listened to him, he listened to me. And suddenly we were from the same hood. Yeah. So did you have something to say, Davina? That that was so good. I was excited. Um, you know, the 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 tough conversation, she handled that beautifully because she got past that that initial yuckiness that many people turn and run from or decide to confront in a, in a negative way that only makes it worse. Again, it's about the dialogue. And we don't always know how that dialogue is going to show up, right? Um, but yeah, it is about identity. It, we keep coming back to identity. And then some people's identity is misplaced. A couple things that were mentioned also that I think is important is when both Bettina and Angela talk about um, racism or, or uh, prejudice within your own race, um, that is another layering, but but I I want to say that the media that the um, that everything around you from the time you're little programs you that dark is 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 not good. Anything dark is not good, right? And I heard a comedian say once that it stuck with me, and I think one of you have a comedic background, but it was really funny. He said, you know, why is everything black have to be bad? Why do black olives have to be in a can and not in a jar? Why do the green olives get to be in a jar, right? Uh, <laughs> and so I was, a, I was a young girl when I heard that and it stuck with me to this day. And I always, I, I set out with intention to never allow my skin color or my shade to be an issue for me for that very reason. Um, because we see inward, right? You know, we feel inward what we see outwardly. And so we have to not embody those negative things about ourselves because that's why people lashed out at Angela. You know, I know that oh so well, being a dark skinned girl. I've heard the light skinned girls get picked on and bullied at school. And I never got that. I never understood it. You don't choose how you're born. I don't get that. You don't, you don't get to choose any of that. So why be mean and bully someone for something that they had no control over? It's just ridiculous. But it's about how the person who's bullying feels inside. So my thing is all behavior is communication, good or bad. What are you trying to tell me? And so in May, you did a wonderful job in getting that guy to tell you what he was really feeling. That's what we have to do more of. And I just think micro advocacy is an amazing concept. I love yes. it. So anyway, thank you for letting me have a few more cents in there, Kate. So, uh, I wanted to on. tap. Go ahead. Um, just go ahead. going back to what in May um, experience was with that guy. I thought that was amazing. Um, it's kind of a technique I use when I'm dealing with with kids and adults, um, I, I think it comes down to just delivery. The way that we deliver our responses, uh, we can really de-escalate a situation very, very calm and have that same impact as someone with a full force of anger. Um, and I experienced that with a Facebook post that I did um, earlier this past summer that, um, that actually end up becoming one of the most brilliant projects that I put together um, and the Seattle Times published it for me. So it, it was it was it was kind of it was geared by um, the anger of uh, George Floyd and and Aubrey and all of these things. And I just I just let loose. A lot of people know me for being very cordial and responding respectfully. But this time I didn't I didn't give a crap. I, I was like, look, this is how this is exactly how I feel. I'm angry. I, I don't like this at all. And I I knew that this was OK for me, um, but it's about the bigger picture. And I didn't want to tie into just expressing anger because it's 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 within me. And I wanted to use that anger to inspire. And I was like, OK, how can I do this? So I decided to revamp my delivery. And I came up with a project titled Shoot for Change. So whenever you all get the chance, you just go to Seattle Times and type in Shoot for Change. 
Um, and it was, it was amazing. I was able to connect with so many different people just by reshaping my delivery um, and carrying that same force of anger with me and um, just connecting with so many people um, just like Jim walking on eggshells and so many other people. Um, and we just got to tap into so many different, very close stories that was just amazing. Um, I had over 45 different people just break down in tears. And it was just amazing. I, I didn't think something like this. And it was about me bringing um, my tool of basketball and helping open the door for conversations that is just so instilled in our hearts that we, you know, we don't really know how to go about it. And so um, in May, that delivery uh, was brilliant. And I think that is how you were able to de-escalate um, this very confused individual. And so I just wanted to tap into that. It's happened three times. Mm. So, so there's three questions that I want to be sure to get to. And um, so I'm going to go to the next of those, which is what is systemic racism and why do we need to address it? So who would like to comment on that? Alex? <clears throat> well, I, I don't know that I you know, can provide a, a, a surefire 100% uh, definition of systemic racism but it actually uh, uh, blends in perfectly with something else that, that I was going to bring up because I believe this is a huge part of it. And that is a major part of this discussion I feel should be uh, the role of class and how class really fits into our viewpoints of race and how we treat one another. Uh, for example, just strictly using the Latino community um, you know, I can tell you that those of us who, um, uh, within the Latino community who may be regarded as blue collar, middle class, working class, uh, maybe have, uh, family or, 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 uh, roots within the farm worker community. Um, I, I can tell you that we're pretty solid blue voters yet in the, in the last presidential election, um, Trump got more Latino voters this time around than he did in 2016. And from my, from my experience, from people that I know that voted for him who were Latino, it was primarily Latinos who were upper echelon, wealthy, affluent, and their views are very much impacted, quite frankly, by uh, their pocketbooks, by their wealth, by by their surroundings. And so I think so often what we view as as race relations or systemic racism is also a matter of classism. I think that we uh, essentially uh, so oftentimes people are debased uh, based on whether they are in in that other person's stratosphere economically. And I, I think that is, I think that's real. I think that's tangible. I think um, part of systemic racism, not, not the only part of it, but part of it um, is essentially defining the other person uh, based on either what you know or what you perceive their wealth to be. And I think um, really touching very much upon what Davina was saying and what Aunt May was saying. If we don't get into uh, each other's perspectives, my, my view has always been a person is a culmination of their experiences and their ambition. So what they've experienced and where they want to go in life, what their motivations are. And if we don't understand how a person grew up, what sort of wealth level they grew up in, then it's really hard to to truly understand them, good or bad. Okay, who else would like to comment on that? Angela? 
Yeah, I just want to add that as far as the systemic um, racism, I think that the much larger picture is, again, the stereotypes, the stigmas, how you are taught from birth, because you're not born with black is, is dark and dreary and white is bright and light and better. Or, you know, I talk about it where I share that I had no idea about the haves or the have nots until I went to a fine art school because I had food, I had shelter, I had clothing and my what was right in front of me was more than enough. I thought my family was well off, <laughs> you know, that I was birthed into. I thought we had the love, we had transportation, we had shelter. I had no idea about this whole other, uh, you know, community outside of mine that was supposed to be better than and other than. So for me, I really think that before you can dismantle, as we have all said, any of it, it has to be a retraining of the brain. And that's one of the things that I use in my tips and tools for success, retrain your brain. I don't care, you can go and we can fight with the police system and say they're corrupt. We can say there's discrimination in practice, you know, practice with practices in hiring blacks, whites, short, you know, obese people or whatever the case is. But until people really retrain their brain and there's processes and there's programs in place to help people just to, to value themselves and value others, I really don't see, you know, this whole, uh, you know, country that's going to where we're going to kumbaya and hold hands together and we're going to all walk in, you know, the whole dream that Martin Luther King Jr. had. I think that what what we can do is what we can do. And that's as we know better, we do better and we speak up and we speak out about it, just like, you know, with N. May and then with Coach, how he mentioned about, OK, I was angry and I was spewing stuff. But then I said, well, let me channel it into something inspirational, which I think that when you take a different approach, a more positive approach to any of this racism, stereotypes, stigma, because I mean, let's let's all be honest. You know, we all have some sort of prejudices or some sort of stereotypes. I know I do in, in different walks of life that I'm trying to get better at and trying to overcome and, and you know, do something a little different. I just don't I don't really see in a be all end all. I think that it's going to start mentally and you have to get people, you know, in from the school systems as they're coming out and, and just have a lot more programs, like I said, and, and processes in place to help people to understand why belittling, berating, um, you know, being destructive towards somebody else, whether they live here or their zip code is this or their name is this or they have 39 commas in their bank account. You know why you still shouldn't look at that person as, uh, you know, as superior or as inferior. So I think that, you know, until we really get a handle on that, I, I really don't see the, uh, the picture or this picturesque, you know, like people are saying, oh, well, I'm going to come up with this organization and that organization. You come up with as many organizations, even from this panel. We all have viewpoints and perspectives and outlooks and they're all positive and we all want to help. But, you know, until we actually reach out and, you know, start incorporating those people that we're talking about helping and then they reach back and they help and then they reach back and they help. I don't really see a whole lot as far as systemic racism. Um, I don't see how how that's going to change. I've gotten opportunities by who I know as opposed to what I knew. So to me, that's a form of stereotype. That's a form of stigma. That's a form of. You know, I mean, some could even call it a little form of racism because I knew so and so and they pulled my resume as opposed to the other one. You know, I mean, I've been entitled. I've been on, on both both sides of it. <laughs> so, you know, that's just my my two cents and my experience with the whole systemic racism. Does it exist? One hundred percent. Does racism is it is it exist? One hundred percent. It does. Um. But I think that until we really, really get into the meat and potatoes of individual mindsets, I don't really see it getting better. Um, I want to say something about that. And, and I agree with you, Angela, that individual mindsets are important. And as individuals, that's where we have to start. 
but there are some things in our society, like say something that Michael knows something about the justice system, uh, the fact that, you know, there's a really high percentage of black men in prison and they go to prison for um, lesser uh, offenses than white men or women do. Um, that's one of the systemic inequities. And those things um, are hard for us to address individually. We have to address them as a society. And that's part of what the systemic racism is. Does anyone have any comments, solutions, ideas on that, Davina? Yeah, I I want to say that there's a lot of different terms being thrown around, and when you you it depends on the lens in which you look at it. You can call it racism, or you can call it bias. You know, um, you can call it classism or sexism, or there's all of these different things that are happening, but uh, back to the point of, yes, there are a lot of biases where systemic racism really, I think when I think, when I hear the term, I think back historical, I think way back. It's not a new thing. It's an old thing and it's a generational thing. And, it, and, and that shows up when people are in power, when people are judges or police officers or teachers. I mean, I am a teacher. I understand very well how we could say there's systemic racism in education because we all know that everything was sanitized and real history was taken out. And, you know, so to me, there are these things that have happened historically that play well into what we now see as systemic racism because your biases are based on what you've been taught. So the biases are what's driving the notion of systemic racism, in my opinion. We may not know why that judge who sits on a bench decides to throw the book at this one young man who happens to be, you know, who happens to look like Dari, as opposed to uh, the next one. And so we may say it's racism, but it may be a culmination of a few different biases. At the end of the day, the truth of the matter is it has to do with a system that is not fair, that continually perpetuates the same practices unchallenged. Mm -hmm. That is, you know, everything is a system, but when that system starts to fail people, it fails people when people are excluded from it. And that's what we're seeing. And I also think that people get offended when you bring up, especially non um, people of color will get offended if you bring up the notion of racism all the time. We use that word all the time. And now it's like, okay, God, is everything racism? <laughs> is everything racism, right? You, you know, and I, and I, and I, even I start to feel that way because, you know, especially during the last presidential administration, I got tired of hearing it. But the truth of the matter is, it's about a lot of stuff, insecurities, biases, miseducation, you know, it's about a lot of stuff to your point, Angela. It's not a solve overnight because we still haven't figured out what all the proper terms are. And class very much so has something to do with it. Money has everything to do with what we've been experiencing in this country. Don't Make no mistake about it. I say more about money than about race. Understand that obviously the people with the money are the people who aren't of color, you know, by and large. I mean, we have some exceptions, obviously, right? The point is we don't we don't even have our glossary straight. We don't even understand all the terms. We're mixing the terms up. It's about bias. It's about stereotypes. It's about all the stuff that we've mentioned. Not, Davina, it's not really bias because bias isn't such a bad thing. Everybody has it. It's when it crosses over into bigotry that it becomes the Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. But it starts with you being biased. It starts with you, 
you know, if you're in, if, if a person has no control, I agree, racism or any ism has to do with the person who has the control over the people who are experiencing it, right? It has to do, you know, in the workplace, we know that. In, in any place where someone's making a decision, but but it does start with, you learn when you're young to be biased about certain people and certain things. Somehow you've learned this, either from your parents or from what you've experienced yourself, you know? Um, white kids get bullied in school, right? By um, other uh, black kids or other races, right? And then they grow up having a fear because you know maybe they lived in an area where they were the minority. I've had those conversations. I've had conversations with people who said to me, you speak well. <laughs> you know, well, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, because the 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 understanding, right, <laughs> Dari? You probably have to, the understanding is I shouldn't. Why do you speak well? I mean, because there's a bias. There's something going on in their minds that they associate black people don't speak well. Apparently, I don't know, but I've heard that my entire life. That doesn't mean the person that says it. I mean, it started with my teachers. You're special. You're exceptional. You're smart. You may go places in life. We hit, it starts in school, the and it just perpetuates, right? And so, does that teacher feel she's racist? No, she believes intrinsically that I'm special because I speak well. <laughs> it's just, well it is what it is. I I want to say something because when I was in college, I took Black Studies. And at the same time, I was taking psychology courses. And I uh, came across this study where they had babies. And they studied how babies reacted to people that were not like them, you know, like other babies that were white and black and Asian and. Um, and I was disappointed at the time to find out that babies are inherently biased. They, you know, they like people that are like them better. Um, and I, I was kind of disappointed because I was hoping that, you know, to babies, it wouldn't matter. But what I we eventually came to decide was when I, uh, they, they continued this study and what they found is yes, babies have that bias, but over time when exposed to, uh, you know, different cultures and different people, that bias lessens and they, you know, they are judging on different things then like, uh, similar interests and, you know, character and things like that. So um, bias by itself isn't enough to, to create bigotry and racism. Right. It goes beyond that. So Kate, I want to ask about the babies. Do you believe that initially that has to do with fear of seeing something that you don't understand? You don't, it's different than what you, when you look at a baby and they have their parents and that's all they know and their parents look a certain way. And then in the, I've had kids in the grocery store buggy, I'm standing right behind a family, you know, and the kid looks at me and, and then starts crying. I don't know what about me, could be my hair, could be a lot of things, but it's something different. And our nature is survival as human beings. At the, you know, our instinct is to survive. And whatever is a threat to that survival, we react to. Babies are reacting to what they don't understand. And yet that over time, once they realize, oh, more people have a different color skin, and they're exposed, then they're, that lessens the fear. But that to me is not, I mean, that's just about survival. It really is. Um, yes, I, I think it's two things. I think it's, yes, fear of the unknown 
And the other thing is just that, you know, we like things that are like us and everybody mm. does seem to have that bias. That isn't a bad thing in itself. It's, you know, if, if you, if you take it further to bigotry, which is disliking or prejudiced against someone just based on something like race or culture or political party or anything, any like you're disliking them because they're part of this So, my <laughs> go ahead, Jim. <laughs> so, one thing I one thing I would like to say, if I could, um, regarding what Davina said about bias, I think that um, the bias is a great place to start because it's a much easier sell. You know, mm -hmm. you can because if you start telling people, because this is the, this is the thing that I see from from uh, some of my some of my Facebook connections is that they think everybody's calling them racist and um and nobody wants to be a racist but everybody i think if you have any kind of, if, i mean if you're not smart enough to understand you you have bias we're, we're not getting anywhere with you anyway but um that but i think that you can sell that to them is like look you may not be a racist but you certainly have biases and unless you uh, are aware of that and you actively try to um to rectify that to even go against your biases then you're going to be stuck, and so um, I, I really I like the I, I like the idea of bias, and I think also that bias um, is 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 going to if if we don't address it, it's just going to keep trickling in, and and just continuing on with this this systemic racism uh, that we have. And I think you know I think sometimes people you know what I've heard is people say, well, it's not written down, it's not you know it's not um, you know kind of um you know codified so it's not really systemic racism but but i do think it's i mean it's system-wide we see it everywhere but again a lot of this could could simply be coming from a place of bias nobody's trying to do any harm but you know this kid in front of me who who did this bad thing whatever it is um if they look like if i can relate and go wow that looks a lot like my son you know i'm probably going to be a lot more lenient as a judge than if i see somebody and and they look like what I've seen on TV as like a thug, right? Uh, it's it's going to be tough to to get away from that that kind of a kind of a bias, and I think it somehow it needs to be uh, educated, trained. I don't know what. Mm. Yeah, in in the law enforcement, you got to take an an, an an intrinsic bias class. So we take an intrinsic bias class, and they put up on the screen, what do you see? They showed a black man, all right, and he was dark. And everybody got to put in their answers. And the first thing that came up was thief. Then the second, the, the, the bigger the word, the more popular. And then it was aggressive. And then it was um, athletic. And then it was anything smart, intelligent was way out there, very small print, right? And it's like, wow, I'm going. And and so it's like, you ain't got a chance. So we talked about the bias and the, and the policemen have to take this class. What are they seeing when they get out there? Who are they arresting and what is their impression of them as opposed to, as opposed to a human being? I'm going to arrest a human being. No, he's a black human being. Therefore, he deserves a certain specific type of treatment. OK. And when, when, when I see this and and people of color can talk about this, what do you see when you look at me? What does that baby see? And I always go like this because we're trying to we're trying to change the mind of policemen and how they operate. Well, you got to go back to, as we talked about, as Davina stated, and the one here has mentioned, what goes on at home on that dinner table? Who's saying what about certain people? And how is it ingrained, ingrained, ingrained? And then I go, you know, then you get to the school, and then it's more ingrained, and then we take it out. And then we guess what? We get to use that. And like you said, Joe, we got to take a step back and go, hold on, before I judge that person, let me, let me, of what I learned from, um, from the classes or anything, let me just make sure, no, that's a human. Let's see what he does first before I make an assessment. And that's what we don't do. We just because it's easier just to, you know, stereotype that group does this. We're good. It's just easy. And until we understand my I'm a, I love history. Things start from somewhere. 
You just don't sit there and go, well, they came that way and this way. Well, if you read the history books about our history and what they did, you're, man, I, I, was, I, was, I was doing this one of these, uh, you know, let's kill Whitey for a minute. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. But it's history. It's history. I got to chill out here. I'm gonna make, and look at my complexion. Because where I come from, I grew up in Minnesota in the 60s and 70s. I think I'm darker than you, Davina. I do. Because that N word flew with me when I was in first grade. I got 11 siblings. My twin is your color, right? And then he's shorter, though. You'll know that. So, so, so we got that N word, but I'll, I'll, I was fighting through. I was fight, fight, fight. That's all we did because there were four of us and we just fought because of the N word that wrote on the schools. So, I'm always one of my biggest, uh, I guess, where I'm comfortable with, with is white males. I'm going to say something. I dare you to say something. I'm waiting, and I got to calm down because I got to go like this. Well, they weren't there in the 70s and 60s, but I heard it through college, too. So I'll just, let me just wait. So these are, my, this, these are the survival mechanisms we, we develop. And until we can sit there, until we can tell these people who haven't been there and go, listen, you have to understand where I come from. Because, Davina, you went to college. I'm sure uh, Ann May went to college. And Bettina, they touched your skin and said, wow, your skin's. Wow, does that come off or does your hair get wet? Right? <laughs> These are the things. And, and like you said, it was it was an innocent question. I said, I can't blame you for that because you've never met anyone who looked like me. You see it on the TV, and that TV propels all kinds of things. And I always tell, I go like this. If, if you see the black man stealing something on TV in the 7-Eleven or a brown man, he can take four or five hundred dollars. But if you look at the two white nuns, over here who stole $500,000 from the school, who's more of the thief? Okay, it's just, just how we, it's just this whole thing of how we, we think of certain people. When you say doctor, what do you think about? White male. When you say police officer, what do you think about? White male. Say thug, oh, that's a black guy, all, all the way, all the way. So these are the things that we gotta really take a step back and go, take time to picture or get the truth of who these people are before we make an assessment. Definitely. Yes. So uh, what is anti-racism? Oh, anti. Why does it matter? I mean, people have been saying that recently, that we, need to, we don't need to not be racist. We need to be anti-racist. So what does that mean then? Um, my pers are you calling on me, Kate? <laughs> I want to be out of order. <laughs> I might okay. to, but you jumped in before. <laughs> because I'm so good at that. <laughs> okay, <All right>. sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, so I'm going to say that anti-racism has to be about uh, taking a stand and advocating against racism. It's not enough to say, I'm not a racist. Now we need to take it a step further and, and whenever witnessed or encountering it, do something, say something. Do not be a, a, a standby person, like standing by while people are being bullied. Um, because that to me is no different than being a bully yourself. Now, let me add something to that because I've been in some heated discussions about this point in that <clears throat> people saying, well, what am I supposed to do? I go through my life. I have a job. I have a family. What, what do you want me to do, right? So what, what I believe, there's an intersection between that and um, the other thing that intersects is the other notion of, uh, what do you call it, when you are privileged. So white privilege is another term that's been loosely thrown around. So when you look at white privilege, a lot of times what it is, is what we see as privilege is the fact that you don't see what's happening around you. You don't see the racism. You don't see the behaviors because you haven't had to see it. You haven't lived a life where you would recognize it. You and I can be in a car driving down the street and certain things can happen. And I know comedians, I love stand up comedy, so I always refer to comedy, but comedians often talk about young black kids with white friends. And a cop pulls them over and the white kid just, you know, what are you doing? How dare you? Blah, blah, blah. And the black kid is like scared to death. It's because the white kid has no, no understanding of the danger, the inherent danger of talking back to this cop. 
Whereas the black kids whole orientation is, and they've been taught not to do it, right? Well, anti-racism says, I see it. I see you. I see how you feel. I see what you've been experiencing. I understand and I'm against it. And so I have friends that I know very well, if they witness something happening, a bias toward me that seemed racially motivated, they would step up and say, wait a minute, and, 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 and put themselves on the line. And I think that just like the young man who was almost hung in the woods that was in the media when he was out, I don't know, star watching or whatever he was gonna do. And he was with, there were white people that were around they put themselves in harm's way. They stood up for him. If they had walked away, they could have very well said, I'm not a racist. I would never try to hang a guy in the woods, but it's not my problem. They didn't do that. These people stayed and begged and put their phones up and said everything they could to get that guy from the clinches of these people who were obviously drunk and who would have probably killed him. That's anti-racism. That's saying, I see you. You matter. I get it. I'm not going to, not on my watch. That's how I define it. Absolutely. Alex? I love stand up comedians too, Davina. Just wanted you to know that. I quote them all the time. Um, I believe that anti racism, a major part of it is you oftentimes will hear. Uh, people or or I'll have I'll have friends uh, that are primarily white say, well, I don't see race, I don't see race, so don't talk to me about race because I just don't see it. And I tell them, no, what anti-racism is is we want you to see us, we want you to see race in the sense that we want you to know our experiences, our culture, our heritage, and just like you just brought up, we want you to know why. A cop approaching is a far different experience for some people as opposed to others. That not everyone has the same feelings or, or, or has had the same experiences when it comes to law enforcement or anything else. We want you to acknowledge who we are. We want to be seen. I also believe that part of anti racism is what everyone right now is calling cancel culture. To me, it's not cancel culture, it's accountability. And mind you, I think every every um, uh, example should be looked upon as an individual example as to whether something should be quote unquote canceled or not. Uh, you know, every every example uh, it, you know merits individual discussion. But as a whole, I personally am glad that we are experiencing this reckoning because for mm -hmm. centuries we are we have allowed ourselves to build statues and schools and states and cities, for Pete's sake, of known racists. And we have allowed for movies and TV shows and any other form of entertainment that we have consumed to have racist overtones and we just wink at it or look the other way. And now there is a reckoning. So I think that is also part of anti-racism and then finally the the last thing that i'll say is i think um so much of a part of that is being able to just acknowledge uh who other people are who we are how we view each other and just dialogue and just dialogue and make sure that that, that we move forward and acknowledge again i see you i feel you these are my experiences and let's move forward Okay. Did did somebody Bettina? And you know, sometimes it starts in the most simple of ways, you know, because we have just accustomed ourselves to certain language, you know, um speaking about uh the difference in crimes. We call it white collar crimes. We have the blacklist, we have the black platinum card, we have the 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 black everything. You know, it's like it's either black or it's white. And so just something as simple as paying attention to your own languaging 
and also identifying some things in our culture that we've just gotten plain used to saying that needs to go away, you know? And um, words have power, they have meaning. Um, you know, you, you, can, you can have a lot of messaging that's going into our children without meaning to do harm, but doing a lot of harm. And so I think when we, when we address our language, when we listen for what others are saying, bring correction to the conversation. Um, you know, I, I, I want to go back to Anne May's uh, opportunity there. <laughs> I was saying that, you know, we're here to create memories, not, my, not, not nightmares. So, you know, that's another anti-racist action that I'm taking is to make sure that when I am conversing with people who may very well be racist, who may be in fact bigots, is to be able to cut through the black and white thinking, the thinking that they're different, so different than me that we can't have a conversation, to lean in to grab a hold of that heart, open that door to do something more powerful that love would help heal. So I think the words and the actions, I think that's when I think about anti-racist, I think about education, I think about changing my language, I think about catching the subtleties and the, the nuances of things that are going on in the world that are just so, they're, they're like on the surface. I mean, just to give you an example, when I was um, first out in the uh, nursing world and I was working at a couple of hospitals, they would, they would each hospital selected me to be in a photo opportunity there. I was all, I was like thrilled, you know, but subtly they were also saying, we want you in there because you represent race. Subtle. Mm -hmm. And I'll mm -hmm. still, I still remember this to the day that happened like 40 years ago, right? Or 30 some years ago. That's a subtle thing. How do we use our words? How do we use our actions to, to make action happen on for the greater good? Yeah, I got that. Angela? Yes, I don't know if you guys can see behind me, but my um, banner, it says words, the heart and mind obey them. So I agree 1000%. It's all about what we speak and how we speak. I think there's a duality, but you have to have good conscience to know what that balance is. Sometimes it's like, well, silence to walk away when there's too much confrontation or where, you know, what you're trying to stand up for, it probably could go south and not end well. Or when there's need, like with Inmate May and the situation that she had with, you know, being able to work through the confrontation, the hostile co confrontation that she had with the gentleman. But, you know, sometimes we're taught suppression is good. No, I'm not going to say anything because all oh, that silence means that I'm strong. But in any form of racism, silence means you're weak and you need to speak out. I have so many instances. I'm just going to share this one. And I know people are going to shake their head in agreement. And they're going to understand that is a commonality that has been, um, you know, ingrained into our culture for so long. Good versus bad hair. Oh. What, what the hell and why? OK. <laughs> Where does that come from? I don't know. I've had so many people. Oh, you got good hair. Oh, you got that good stuff. Oh, you got good hair, good hair, good hair. One of the things that I have taken to um, heart and am trying to drastically change the, the verbiage of that, it's not a good versus bad hair. It's texture. My hair is a different texture. And it's not that it's good or that it's bad. I am not Beyonce. I don't wake up like this. This is products. <laughs> and even when I had long hair or whatever else, it's always products. And it's time for me to do what needs to be done for me to look presentable with my hair. But there's, you know, even and that seems so trivial with people saying, oh, you know, well, she got that good stuff or he has good hair or bad hair. But what happens is, is you ingrain that into our children and they mm -hmm. hear that. And what are what are they supposed to think? You know, if my if their hair does not look like mine and someone is calling my hair good, what's the opposite of good? That must mean their hair is bad. 
So, you know, being able to speak up and speak out whenever I'm faced with that situation. I had another young lady, I was walking around the track and she was an older, I'm assuming she was a, a Caucasian lady. I'm not really sure. She looked white to me, but you know, she's always saying how angelic I look. Now I have another friend of mine who's darker than me. True story. That's darker than me. We're walking the same time, but she's always complimenting me. She's always saying, you know, how I look angelic and how, how pretty I am. So this one particular uh, meeting that we had, she said, you know, Angela, because, you know, I know, uh, got to know her a little bit. She said, you know, Angela, black and white sure make pretty babies. And I said, you know what, Miss So-and-so, black and black make pretty babies too. Latino and Latino make pretty babies also. Mexican and Mexican, Asian and Asian. I mean, I just kind of went down the line because again, to me, mm -hmm. silence in that particular situation would have meant that I was weak and that I was not necessarily accepting what she said, but that was my opportunity to say, mm, no, what you're saying or how you how you feel about that situation is a little off balance. But I'm just going to impart how I how I think about that. <laughs> so I agree. I think anti-racism is, um, you know, is definitely is needed. But I think it's for all stereotypes not just again i and i know this particular form form you know is is maybe a little bit geared towards black and white or you know the the race relations but it's so much bigger and broader than that for me because i i'm on all ends of the spectrum where you know i grew up with my grandparents didn't have a mother and father in the home so i was that statistic and then i was unwed and pregnant that statistic then i was divorced that statistic then i'm light-skinned trying to you know fit in that's i mean you know the elite nfl lifestyle that statistic so i just feel like you know as you know better you definitely should do better and you you're you know you you're not silent especially when you know that people could potentially be hurting by something that is viewed upon that you know i'm more superior in this vein because my hair is this texture or because i'm lighter or because my ex-husband played football or whatever the case is and it just you know it, it has to be i think tactfully handled and so that's my take on anti-racism yes you're you're right it is all related all of the inequality and oppression is related it's not just race it's gender, it's money, it's everything. So um, we, we're down to two last questions now. Um, one is, um, and, and everybody can answer this, what is one way we can move forward and see real change? So if, if everyone could just give their Two cents. <laughs> um, Davina. Okay, Davina first. Oh, did you have your hand Bet up? Bettina. Bettina had her hand up. I yeah, saw Yeah, she Bettina. she had her hand up first. Oh, okay, Bettina. Then. Mm -hmm. You're muted. Uh oh, you're muted. Bettina. Sorry about that. Okay. So I would be remiss if I didn't speak into the conversation of empowerment, because at the end of the day, this is at the helm of this entire conversation is empowerment, you know? And if you define that empowerment, which is about change, it's about choice, it's about power, and it's about the process by which individuals or groups with little or no power and ability if, make choices that affect their lives, this is, more of a, a unifying conversation because then we're not talking about bigotry. Then we're not talking about race. We're not talking about a number of things. And it's a, it's an easier way for people to come into the conversation. And I know that many people are trying to find their voice and they're seeking the words that are right for them to fully express their talents, their intelligence and their power because your words are your ambassadors and they open and they shut those doors that we know help to teach people how to treat you. 
and how to believe in you and how to change your life. So I think that would be my final comments is that empowerment delivers choice. And somebody said earlier that it's about the money. That is another key thing. We need to shatter the glass ceiling for those that have been disempowered. And until we do that for all, we haven't really gotten very far as a culture, as a nation, as a world, in my view. Thank you so much for having me, Kate. So um, who, who's next? I'll, I'll go really quick. Um, so just to answer the, the question about what's one thing we can do to move forward. Um, I think we can make um, real change by uh, individually thinking of how can we create a soup. And what I mean by that is a soup with three with three things is uh, three ingredients, I should say, a soup filled with compassion, a soup filled with um, empowerment and a soup filled with redefining what self-dignity means um, to each individual. And I think that if we can uh, really all stir this, this soup together, we can find that um, what changes everything is love. And I think love is what connects all three of those things together that will overpower this person stalled over this person stalled or she looks like this or what angela says the good hair or i'm a young black man dark skin and i wear a black hoodie and i'm non-threatening in may looks like this michael he, you know he's got this gray beard going on he can be this jim is over here walking on eggshells oh but he's a comedian so i don't need to trust this guy davina's looking like this and all of these different things compassion empowering and redefining self-dignity the 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 soup that what we're going to have what we're going to feast on is love that's that's what is going to come down to love and because love heals everything and it has no 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 vision for racism it has no vision or oh, this person deserves this much love it is just there and I think that if we all collectively create that that soup, um, we're, we're going to be tasting the same thing and we're going to be able to say, hey, it seems like you're running low on your soup. Would you like to have some of mine? And boom, there we go. Okay, you're making us all hungry, Dre. <laughs> And hey, you know, I, I just got it. I was looking at it from that perspective. I really do think that. So I'm glad I can, um, you know, feast your appetite. <laughs> Angela. Yes, thank you. And I'm ready for the soup. <laughs> I will say it's just going to go back to what my company and others that I'm trying to forge with, and that's putting programs in place for our youth. You have to catch people, I believe, at a certain age, because once you've gotten like 49 like me, we're pretty much stuck in our ways. There's a lot for me to learn, but I'm a little bit more stubborn. <laughs> but I think that if we catch them very, very early, I'm talking like, you know, daycare, um, daycare age, uh, elementary school age, middle school age, high school, and it becomes a mandatory course, college, it becomes a mandatory course that a lot of the things that we are learned, uh, that is learned at home or the environment that we're in, some of it, I believe we can make change and we can affect change in you know how we view other people regardless of what we hear around the dinner table i heard lots of stuff <laughs> around multiple diff uh, dinner tables that i sat at from family members and friends and whatnot but me today i can stand very very confidently and proudly in what my values and my beliefs and how i think you know, I should uphold myself and how I should also look, look for others. And I think that by having programs that teach trust, that teach, um, you know, valuing other people, all of the things that are going to make that whole superior, inferior line go, you know, disappear. I think that that would be very, very necessary. We have all of these other classes and courses in school. Some of them you don't even use in later on in life. That's a course you would definitely use. <laughs> and I think it would definitely 
you know, hold its, hold its, um, you know, hold its weight to just help us to unlearn, to retrain, to empower, to engage, you know, um, just to really respect uh, everybody as a whole. So that that would be my my two cents and what we can do. I think their mandatory programs need to be put in place. <laughs> yes, definitely, Alex. We are approaching the year anniversary that we first heard the name Ahmad Arbery come into our consciousness. Many people, I, I think popular notion is that the George Floyd murder uh, was the first movement that really encompassed all communities and all uh, ethnicities. I believe that it actually began with Ahmad Arbery uh, because I remember and I want to say it was April 24th, that, that number uh, sticks out in my mind. I, I recall uh, April 24th, 23rd, you know, somewhere around there. The reason it stood out was because when I read that the actual murder occurred a month earlier, my first reaction was, are you kidding me? This happened over a month ago and the police have hit it for a month? And then when I posted that on my social media, the outrage that came from so many others of all ethnicities and all communities, the mutual outrage that this happened, I felt was a turning point for our country. And then of course, when Mr. Floyd was murdered over Memorial Day weekend, uh, that really was the tipping point. In order to combat all the things that we have talked about, it's going to take all of us. It's going to take all of us. And that includes not simply preaching to the choir and having communities of color be the one to lead this discussion. It's going to take all of us. Part of that, and this is my final point, part of that is you began this discussion, Kate, by asking us about the Capitol insurrection. I keep going back to beyond politics, what would make people do those things and it was mentioned earlier the word fear the people that led the capital insurrection people that abide in racism and opposite of what coach said do not live in love they're living in fear they are fearing that something is being taken away from them they are fearing that so and so communities are taking over on May just logged off, but when that gentleman accosted her at the store, he was obviously operating in fear above all else. And that and that really uh, showed itself through hatred. We need to find out why people are fearing the things they are, why that fear exists. We need to combat that, obviously, but we need to have the same vigor and unity and collective well, just and have the collective have the same collective uh determination that we did with Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd and not just let tragic events like that be a flashpoint we need for uh this to be a daily discussion but it's going to take all of us yes wow. okay um and May, do you want to go <laughs> no, no, I mean, do you want to tell? Do you want to say what one thing we can do is? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I want to stay. I want to stay. <laughs> I don't want to go. I don't want to go. <laughs> See, there's two different meanings here. Okay, I think it's micro advocacy. Mm. If you see something say something if you feel something do something mm -hmm. it's serious it's a serious condition now this mm -hmm. is another form of a pandemic please mm -hmm. and my my form is to address with humor address mm -hmm. with kindness address with empathy and you're going to walk away with a friend that man in costco he had diapers in his crate and i know he was scared for his babies so that's where I started. I said, you're scared for your babies. You are scared for your babies. I get it. I have a lot of those. 
Okay. We create commonality. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Michael? Ooh, uh, wow. To see change, man. I'm, I'm looking at this, this, this small miracle. You know, when, when Alex talks about fear and we have Livina talk about money and, and, and you have a certain dominant group that's been a certain way and a certain belief and ideology for, for 200 or maybe more years. We'll talk about America and you've been on top, you know, and it's been your way and you've had your way. And now things are shifting and it is a scary proposition. It is so scary. So when they say working class men, what they really mean is poor whites. And it's scary that white the women are graduating from college more. You see more women having more businesses. All these things are changing. And it's like, well, well we had this way just because we were entitled or we were privileged because of our color, that's not really working. So it's a scary proposition. And, and my question is, why can't we just, we know this is a, a melting pot. Why is it so difficult to have the melting pot? For everybody to do their thing and come together as one. So in order for us to change, the people who have the fear need to recognize and understand their own privilege and what they can do with that. And to, and to possibly uh, support everyone who comes up and not be afraid of change. And not Because we are becoming brown. This is the browning of America. In 2020, what, 2042 or something? The whites will be the minority. That man, they're like, what? Right? That's yeah, scary. It's scary. And the other one would be to examine our own biases and consider where they came from. Why do you think this way? If you look at something, does that thing say because you look like that you must be blank, as opposed to let me understand you as the human being? And that's a hard thing for people to swallow. And so we really got to really sit down and go, where does that come from? And, and, and not judge and, 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 just, and just criticize and stereotype and put these people in a category. And I want to see you as the human being. So when I see a black man or a black woman or a Hispanic, these are people to me. And until they do something, say, okay, well, you're that kind. You know, you know, well, you're not very, okay, so I get it. But you're still that person or that ethnic group. But everybody has a bad seed. Okay, we get that. But just, yeah, we get that. But, yeah, the human condition, man, just, you know, always people would see that. So, yeah, wake up, people, and just acknowledge, you know, what you're going through. All right. I'm out. Love it, Michael. Well, okay, so <clears throat> I I believe wholeheartedly that it starts with the individual, right? And so with with um, like with the workshops that I teach, uh, there are so many different lenses in which we can see all the things that we've talked about uh, today. And so starting with why you have the fear as an individual and doing the work to understand yourself first. I don't think that uh, you can do much beyond yourself if you haven't rectified who you are. And so I'm very much so a proponent of um, self personal development, right? And, and like Angela said, start when they're young. That's why I work with teens and youth because I believe that if we can help them get beyond some of the things that they may encounter in the future, that would be um, very beneficial. Uh, I also understand that we all have experienced trauma at some point in our lives. We've all experienced adversity. Those are the things that shape in, in our brain as we understand the elasticity of our brain. And we understand that we think a certain way and we are a certain way. So it's so much deeper than us just looking at someone and saying, all we need is love. Although we know that to be true, it's getting people to the point where they can recognize that. That's the hard part. So what I would say is that if each individual could be personally accountable to be better, to live their best life, it would change the world immensely. I keep coming back to each individual be accountable. Be accountable for your actions and be accountable for the way you think. Now, beyond that, it gets so much better once you start working on yourself. When your cup is full, now you can go beyond that and you can start to fill the cups of others. So I say personal accountability. Great. So the, the remaining people that are here um, that were able to stay since we've gone way over time, um, could you please uh, give 
one um, short last thought from today's show and then your contact information if people want to get in touch with you. So we'll just go around in, in uh, order. So Davina. I'll be very brief. DavinaLyons.com. Go to my website, DavinaLyons.com. You see the programs I offer, what I do with my monthly workshops. And, um, and, and I just want to say that uh, communication is one of the greatest things in the world. Afforded the opportunity to communicate in the way that we have today, Kate, is absolutely essential. I thank you. That's it. Alex? We need to continue to do what we're doing today. And I thank you, Kate, for providing this forum. I thank you for allowing us to share and discuss and take it out to everyone. Um, we live in an, in an era and an age of the most amplified communication in the history of the world. We need to use that uh, for good. Uh, as someone said earlier, when you see something, say something. When you feel something, say something. And when you see another group uh, being marginalized that may not necessarily be your group, so to speak, say something as well. Even social media commentary makes a difference because it's it's uh, shaping the way that, that, that we view the world and we need to continue to live in love and live as allies for one another. Uh, you can reach me at alexmontoya.org and I am also on just about every social media platform you can think of, including TikTok. So find me anywhere. Awesome. Um, I think uh, today's show was magnificent. I think it was uh, much needed. Uh, we need to continue to have these these shows. Um, for me personally, uh, it just opened so many different perspectives from all of you amazing, inspiring individuals. Um, and I think that um, continue to having these type of conversations while having action followed up behind it um, is greatly needed. And so I think today, uh, once we all uh, log off here, we're gonna go about that in very micro ways, um, and then it'll turn into uh, magnificent ways. And so I think uh, with today's show, thank you, Kate. Um, again, so grateful every time you invite me to be a part of these um, conversations, I love it. Um, it gives people to see uh, me outside of being an athlete and a coach um, and seeing my perspective from uh, worldly standpoints. And so I think that's what I got from uh, today's show. Uh, how you can contact me um, is just generally through Facebook, um, Doree Arrington. Facebook, um, and it lists all of my other social accounts um, on my Facebook. I'm easy to contact, message me, whatever. Um, so yes, that's that would be the best way to contact me on, on there. Dere Ray Arrington on Facebook. Yeah, Dere Ray Arrington. Yeah, I use my full name, so I, I want the world to know my full name. So. Yes, Bettina? <laughs> Oh, thank you so much, Kate. This has been just an invigorating conversation. You did a marvelous job of putting together a panel. I was the last minute ad, and I have to say, this is a this was a great morning for me. <laughs> I'm actually the founder of We Empower You Community and the WeEmpowerYourLife.com website, and we have monthly, we have weekly, and we have annual and and quarterly um, meetings, events, summits, mixers. And so just go to weempoweryourlife.com. I'm here to help shatter the revenue glass ceiling. I'm all about empowerment. And this is a worldwide movement that I've started. So we're in countries all across the world. Weempoweryourlife.com. Again, um, accolades to you here, Kate, for putting us all together. <laughs> Michael? Uh, let's see here. It is, we are in the tunnel. And we are in, in part of a difficult conversation that needs to be exposed. And all this truth telling makes this uncomfortable. But we need to keep going down that road because we keep shaking that tree and we can't stop because this 
systemic racism has gone on for a long time and certain people are getting tired. That's basically what's happening. And so keep, keep pushing, keep talking and do it in a way that's dignified, you know, and get the people who are uncomfortable with them to open up more so they can go. Oh, so this is how you, this is what you guys experience every day. Yeah. Have some empathy for that. So the more we can get people to talk about it, especially you know the dominant culture, the more we have an we have an advantage to really move forward step by step and down the road. Of hopefully, where everybody you know can be a kumbaya. But yeah, we yeah, yeah. keep shaking that tree. Oh, oh, get a hold of that's right. Hi, um, Go ahead. Geez. Michael Go ahead. Loden .com. It's really easy. MichaelLoden.com. You can find all the programs. And our company is called Final Step International. Final Step International. Dot o dot com. Thanks, everyone. Angela. Thank you so much again for having me, Kate. I want to say as a former, and I'm sure the coach is going to appreciate this uh, statement, as a former NFL wife, change and evolution can only come about with players in the game. You mm -hmm. cannot affect change by being a spectator or being on the bench. Everyone on this panel today is a player and y'all are a starter. And I appreciate that from the diversity to the mindset, to the insight, to the perspectives, but you're in the game, you know? And I think that that's a great thing. I try to really encourage and teach my mentees that when you're a spectator, you can't win the game. You have to get off the bench and get in the game of life. And that's what everyone on this panel has done. So kudos to you guys. I've learned so much. I've absorbed so much. Um, I can be reached. www.inotherwordsbystone.com Or you can just Google Angela Marshall. I too am like Alex. I am on every platform known to man and woman because I am on a global mission to empower to impact and influence through my words work and wisdom so please reach out let's stay connected i don't Absolutely. believe in, i don't believe in the one and done so <laughs> hey let's stay connected that's the other way to uh to impact and affect change thank you again kate you know i i, I love you to life so i want to thank all of you for being here and those who had to leave early or leave late <laughs> um, for being here and having this uh, discussion today. We do have a comment I want to share with you from a, 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 someone who's been listening. It says, thank you so much for all of the great individuals that contributed to the panel today. Such a necessary topic um, gave me many ideas on how I can move forward as an individual and put something meaningful in action. I hope you can connect with everyone in the group sometime in the future that I haven't already met. Again, thank you all. Um, oh, it's, it's from my son. <laughs> it says, thanks mom for organizing this panel and contributing to inspire change outside of yourself. It just says Facebook user because apparently he didn't register, but <laughs> Thanks, Chris. <laughs> so, you know, I appreciate you all being here and having this discussion. And um, I have uh, a quote uh, to share with uh, the listeners to carry with you through your week. Um, that is, racism is still with us, but it is, it is up to us to prepare our children for what they have to meet and hopefully we shall overcome. And that quote was said by Rosa Parks. And so it's still relevant and we have a lot of work left to do, but I think we're up to it. So thank you all for being here and uh, thank the listeners and I'm just going to say bye for now. I have one more thing to say. I just have one more thing to say. I want to leave everybody with um, my mantra from my brand, and that is to um, 
do what you never done to get what you never had. And that's what I live by every single day. And I would love it if you guys share that with um, individuals that you come in contact with. Um, I think it's so important and so powerful, um, how if depending on how you look at that. But um, that's a mantra I live by, um, and that, that represents me and my brand and my livelihood. So I wanted to just share that with you. Thank you. So now we're going to say goodbye. And Hi, everyone. to people who might be listening, um, the regular show is on Tuesdays, 3 p.m. Pacific time. And next Tuesday, I'm going to be interviewing uh, Victoria Marie Gallagher, and we're going to find out how to manifest your soulmate. So join us Tuesday at 3 p.m. Thank you for listening to Soul Fire Wisdom with Kate Olson. We hope you enjoyed the show. If we made you laugh, brightened your day, or sparked a new thought, we have succeeded in our mission. Join us next time when we'll share more secrets and truths and all the magic of transformation that is the journey to Soul Fire Wisdom. Always remember, be fierce in the pursuit of what sets your soul on fire.